Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Aliens and UFOs video. Alright, let's continue the book, UFO Sightings by Alan Baker. This time starting a whole new chapter. This will be part one of this chapter. And it's already looking to be a very fascinating one. In fact, the, the topic associated with it is harassment of UFO witnesses. So as you can see, the whole chapter is basically going to be dedicated to how many different ways... People that have seen UFOs are subsequently attacked or harassed by various sources. In fact, the very first segment you're going to especially love because I talked about it in the past. It's known as the Mysterious Men in Black. That's definitely the first segment here. Exciting stuff. So let me go ahead. I'll start this part one here and then I'll give my own thoughts and opinions. And I'd love to hear what your comments are. There's definitely a lot of people out there that have opinions associated with the MIB. And no, this is not the stuff involving Will Smith and the dancing aliens. No, these are the ones that are absolutely the more nefarious kind. So let's go ahead and let's start that segment here. And here's what it says. The reader will doubtly appreciate, especially after reading the preceding chapter, that the world of ufology can be a place where fact and fiction blend into a complex and confusing unity, becoming a mystery that demands to be considered in an artistic as much as a scientific context. Indeed, UFOs are capable of casting a long shadow over those humans who are fortunate or unfortunate enough to come into contact with them. And the things that move within that shadow are not always amenable to explanation in terms that make sense to the late 20th century mind. Among the strangest of entities associated with UFO encounters are the Men in Black, MIBs, who have been reported on many occasions to visit witnesses soon after an encounter, claiming to be connected with either the government, military, or UFO investigation groups in some way. Their identification, when shown, is always subsequently found to be false, as are the registration numbers on their immaculate but out-of-date black cars. For one of the best examples of an MIB encounter, we can look to psychiatrist Bertolt Schwartz, who discusses the strange case of Dr. Herbert Hopkins in his 1988 book, UFO Dynamics, Psychiatric and Psychic Aspects of the UFO Syndrome. Dr. Hopkins had been engaged in investigating an alleged UFO encounter experienced by a man named David Stevens through the use of regressive hypnosis. On the evening of September 11th, 1976, Dr. Hopkins' wife and son went out to see a movie, leaving him alone in their house in Orchard Beach, Maine. He received a telephone call from a man claiming to be a member of a UFO organization based in New Jersey who asked if he might talk to Hopkins about the Stevens case. Hopkins agreed and invited him over to the house. Hardly had the uh, physician replaced the receiver when the caller presented himself right there at the front door. He was completely bald and dressed in an immaculate black suit, black tie, and white shirt. Apart from this, however, his preference at normality was less of a success. He had no eyebrows or eyelashes, and when he later rubbed his mouth, it became evident that he was wearing red lipstick. The strange visitor walked stiffly and then sat perfectly still, like an automaton. He began to ask Hopkins various questions about the case and the expressionless monotone used by most MIBs. Presently, the man said that Hopkins had some coins in his pocket and asked him to take one out. Hopkins held a coin in the palm of his hand. As he watched in amazement, its color changed from bright silver to light blue, and it began to grow blurred to his vision. It then became vaporous and gradually faded away. Hopkins told the man that he was impressed and asked him to make the coin reappear. The man refused, saying, Neither you nor anyone else on this plane will ever see that coin again. He then asked Hopkins if he knew how Barney Hill had died. Hopkins replied that as far as he could remember, Hill had died of a stroke. The man said, no, Barney died because he had no heart, just as you no longer have your coin. Having made this bizarre and disturbing statement, the MIB told Hopkins to destroy all materials relating to the Stevens case. Dr. Hopkins' encounter took yet another weird turn when his visitor said, with apparent difficulty, my energy is running low, must go now, goodbye. He left, walking unsteadily around the corner of the house. As soon as the MIB was out of sight, 
Hopkins saw a blue-white light shining on the driveway. He searched for the MIB but could find no trace of him. When Hopkins' wife and son returned from the cinema, they found him in an extremely agitated state, sitting at the kitchen table with a gun and with all the lights in the house switched on. As it happens, Dr. Hopkins had been correct regarding Barney Hill's death. It had nothing to do with his heart, and yet as Richard L. Thompson tells us in his 1993 book, Alien Identities, the MIB's threat had the desired effect, since Hopkins subsequently destroyed all his data on the Stevens case. In his 1986 book, Visions, Apparitions, Alien Visitors, Hillary Evans relates another curious story of the MIBs. In 1967, a man named Robert Richardson from Toledo, Ohio, was driving in his car when he collided with a landed UFO. When he later returned to the scene, he found a piece of metal lying on the road, which he collected and subsequently sent to a UFO investigation group. On July 16, 1967, Richardson was visited by two MIBs who questioned him about his encounter for about 10 minutes. They had arrived in a black 1953 Cadillac, which, despite being 14 years old, was in immaculate condition. Richardson wrote down the registration number of the car, and when he later checked it, he found that it had never been issued. In addition, Richardson said that it did not occur to him to to check his visitor's identification. This is yet another interesting aspect of alleged encounters with MIBs, during which the participants are rarely struck at the time by the unusual behavior or lack of identification of their guests, who are frequently described as looking slightly Asian or with olive complexions. Only later do they realize that all was not well and that they have been talking to people who did not quite seem to be entirely human. One week after Richardson's encounter with the MIBs, two different men called on him, again wearing black suits. After attempting to call uh, Richardson into admitting that he had not had a UFO encounter, they asked him for the piece of metal he had picked up on the road. When he replied that he had sent it to a UFO organization, the MIB said he had better get it back if he wanted his wife to stay as pretty as she was. This is a classic piece of heavy band B movie dialogue of which the MIB seem to be inordinately fond of. There is something ghostly and folkloric about these bizarre personages. Although they appear to be subtly non-human, they are most certainly not alien in the extraterrestrial sense. They seem to have more common with the traditional specter than the modern spaceman. Indeed, one of the theories put forward to explain the appearance of apparitions in haunted houses is that they are a kind of psychic recording of a previous event or emotion, which are stored in the fabric of a building or other geographic location, and periodically played back through processes that are still ill understood. Anyone remotely acquainted with American history will be aware of the nightmare of paranoia that gripped the country in the 1950s, in which many suspected communists were ruined by means of highly publicized but frequently unfounded allegations. It may not be stretching the bounds of possibility too much to suggest that the trauma of these times could be described as the national equivalent of the past traumas said to result in more traditional hauntings. The subtle paranoia induced in uh, percipients after a visit from the MIBs, such as Hopkins clutching his loaded gun, might well be a kind of psychic echo of the wider spread paranoia of the 1950s. This would explain why not only the spectral-like quality of the MIBs, but also the fact that their B-movie gangster threats are never followed through. So let's go ahead and let's pause that here, and then I'll give my quick thoughts on here. Next segment is going to do with another bizarre thing involving helicopters, in this case of unmarked ones. But yeah, isn't that fascinating? MIBs, the mysterious men in black. This uh, this particular uh, part of this chapter associated with that talked about some examples. One of the first ones, actually, the one that I mentioned in a video, video like within the last year or so, involving that strange case of Dr. Herbert Hopkins and the fact that he in turn got visited by an MIB and he made that trick with the coin happen and then he made that subtle threat associated with Barney Hill's death and associated uh, with what could happen to him as well. I mentioned that in the video, including also those strange characteristics of that MIB, the fact that he had the straight up immaculate black suit, black tie, white shirt. He had that 
completely bald uh, face at the point where he had no eyebrows or eyelashes as well. And the fact that it looked like he was wearing lipstick and almost moved like an automaton. So it's interesting to see it chronicled here because it has absolutely stood the test of time when it comes to being one of the most premier Men in Black encounters. And then there's the other one that I haven't heard of. Apparently the one that occurred there in Toledo, Ohio with Rich, uh, with Robert Richardson. The fact that he got visited more than one time by MIBs. Wow, what a strange way to have something like that grip him within his life. I mean, the fact that you'll have one, but let alone two encounters, that's at a point where you realize maybe something else is happening. Maybe uh, this person has to start thinking about doing something else or changing things because otherwise who knows how many times they'll continue or they would have continued to visit him. But also interesting that he found that metal rod, whatever that was, lying on the road and they wanted it back. Like they knew that he had it. Somehow with all their technology, they weren't aware that he had sent it off. But at the same time, they were threatening him for it to come back as well. And by the way, if you haven't had a chance, I'm going to include the link below. Um, if uh, I have an interview with, uh, one, with Christian, a friend of mine there in the Las Vegas area. He, in turn, has also had an encounter with an MIB, an actual encounter in the remote area desert of, I guess, if I remember correctly, it was Nevada or somewhere in California with a men in black. So I'm going to include the link below in case you want to hear it. It's a great interview. And uh, it's definitely uh, ties into what I was talking here about these type of bizarre encounters that people have had with them. But let me know what you guys think in the comments below. All right, everybody. Thanks again, as always. Take care.